And ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Real Talk Memphis. I am your humble host, Chip Washington, back on this Monday. Now, I, I don't know if anybody missed the fact that we didn't do a show last week. It's all Adam's fault. Adam was on vacation last week, so we decided. But anyway, we took off last week, and we're back this week, uh, hopefully bigger and better with an all-new Real Talk. First question, as always, how are you? Is everybody doing okay out there? Show of hands, everybody everybody good? You guys good? It was a nice day today. It was a beautiful day today. It was warm today, and I heard it was supposed to rain at some particular point uh, later on, maybe tonight and into tomorrow and into Wednesday and maybe even into Thursday. But you know what? We'll deal with it. With me, as always, Adam is here producing the show. Marquette is here as well. And Jack is even here. And uh, you, you, you may get to know Jack down the road. You know, he may actually be a part of, the, part of the show here at some particular point in time. But always nice to have these guys with me. You know, Adam and Marquette are leaving me soon. You know, they both graduated from high school and they're about to move on down the road. Maybe they'll come back and you know, visit one day if I'm still here in a wheelchair. Maybe they'll come back and say hi. You never can tell. We, well, hopefully we'll have a good show for you tonight. Um, a couple of uh, the folks that we were actually looking to have a couple of weeks ago are going to be with us tonight. Uh, Dr. Janie Johnson uh, is an associate or an assistant professor, actually, at the University of Memphis School of Communication Services. And she's going to be talking about hearing aid health care. We are also going to visit with Mike Miller. He is the owner of Patrick's Neighborhood uh, Restaurant and Bar, and he is also the president of the Memphis Restaurants Association. He is going to talk with us uh, tonight about all things restaurants and the struggles and hiring folks and supply chains and the whole nine yards. And in the second half hour of the show, we are going to have someone that anybody who is anybody familiar with the theater an art scene in this, this city uh, is familiar with uh, Pat Halloran, who was the president and CEO of the Orpheum Theater Group for, oh, 35 years or so. Uh, he's retired now, but he has a new venture, and he is uh, doing his best to give back to the city of Memphis and Shelby County, and he will talk more about that in the second half hour of the show. Uh Adam, do you have um, my birthday theme music uh, available over there somewhere? Why don't you hit that? We're going to do some birthdays, ladies and gentlemen. If you celebrated a birthday over the weekend or today, uh, congratulations to you. Happy birthday goes out to Sally Hines. Sally is the president and CEO of MIFA. Today is her birthday. Happy birthday to Anita Gaither Webb, to Pastor Keith. Norman, uh, First Baptist Broad. So if you know Pastor Keith, tell him we shouted him out on the big radio broadcast. Uh, Moise Vaughn Nicholson, is, it is her birthday today. Uh, Earl Augustus, longtime radio personality in the city of Memphis. Uh, he is now on uh, uh, V101 uh, a, uh, FM in the mornings uh, with uh, Mike and Stormy. So it was his birthday over the weekend and Howard Robertson, husband of Beverly Robertson. You know, I had to put that out there because, you know, we all love Beverly, but we love Howard, too. So 
Happy birthday to you, Howard Robinson. Today is your birthday. And um, what would have been his 63rd birthday? Not yet. What would have been his 63rd birthday? Prince. Today would have been his 63rd birthday. We're going to do a little something on him in just a couple of minutes. Thank you, Adam. Happy birthday. And if you guys uh, celebrated an anniversary or a special occasion, graduation, uh, congratulations to you. And uh, many, 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 many more. Okay, fade me on out. Now, uh, also, um, we wanted to, uh, as we always do, you know, before we do the news and notes, we always talk about notable deaths. I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember a show called The Mod Squad. Mod Squad was on way, way back. I'm actually old enough to remember The Mod Squad. Clarence Williams the third, he played Link, and uh, he died uh, yesterday. He was 81 years of age. Uh, he'd also been in uh, Purple Rain. Speaking of Prince, he actually played Prince's father in that movie. He was in American Gangster. He was in The General's Daughter. Uh, he died of cancer at the age of 81. Uh, also, uh, locally, and I don't know how many of you big sports fans out here, Galen Young uh, was a big-time basketball prospect uh, several years ago. He's a basketball standout. He was an NBA draft choice. Uh, he was tragically killed. A car actually ran into his house. I mean, plowed through his house, and he was actually sitting um, at his computer, and uh, he was uh, hit, and he was killed. And so uh, our prayers go out to Galen Young's family, friends, and those who knew him best. Uh also, before I move on, uh, many of you are familiar with the name Leon Gray. Leon uh, actually is on a syndicated radio show on this radio station um, called Blues in the Basement uh, that you can hear right here on W uh, Y X R. And he um, had a medical episode earlier this morning. I'm to understand he is in the hospital. Uh, right now, I don't have any information on his condition or exactly what happened, but I will say this. Let us all pray for him. Uh, those, you know, he's, he's been on a, a television broadcaster in this town for many years. He was on radio for a very long time at WDIA. So a uh, name that is very familiar to many of us, Leon Gray. Uh, please uh, lift him up in prayer tonight, uh, as well as uh, his family and all those uh, around us. We will keep you posted as we find out more information uh, on his condition. Uh, so as we uh, normally do, and before I move too far along here, I always uh, have to give you the information. If you are uh, trying to uh, find us, you can always go to 91.7 FM WYXR. We are on live right now. You can also hear us live on the TuneIn app, and you can also hear us live on WYXR.org which is the website, okay? So you have three options there. Now, if you happen to miss this fine piece of radio broadcasting tonight, you can also catch us uh, after tomorrow. We will be uh, posted, you know, we're a podcast. So they'll post the show tomorrow, and you'll be able to listen to it wherever you get your podcast. All right, time for some news and notes here on this uh, Monday. Did you hear that the FDA approved the uh, a new Alzheimer's drug, which claims to actually slow the disease, it is the first time in over two decades that a new drug for Alzheimer's has been uh, approved uh, by the FDA. Uh, now they are trying to find out and do follow-up studies to, to confirm whether or not the drug will actually benefit patients. There's always something very, very tragic to me about living 60, 70 years of your life and then all of a sudden having a disease that wipes out every memory you have ever uh, had in your life. I mean, I'm talking about children, marriage, and the whole nine yards. So let us hope that uh, um, as uh, when all is said and done, that this will actually be something good. Vaccinations, ladies and gentlemen, get vaccinated. Vaccination effort has really slowed down uh, a great deal, not only here in Memphis, not only in Shelby County, not only here in the state of Tennessee, but from coast to coast. Um, a lot of folks are really not feeling the vaccination process by now, but um, almost 50 percent of the entire country has been vaccinated with at least one dose. So and, and that's why you see things starting to percolate again. I mean, you see folks all over Beale Street, all in town now, in restaurants, out in the street, movie theaters, the concerts have been big Mempho Fest is coming up here. Robbie and uh, JB and the station have um, uh, primary sponsors of that big event. Uh, 
I'm sure we'll be talking more about that as uh, time moves a bit closer as well. Uh, gun violence is always an issue. We had nine deaths here in four hour in a four hour stretch from Friday to uh, a Saturday. Uh, a couple of car crashes, a couple of shootings, stabbing, a car into the house that unfortunately took the life of Galen Young. I mentioned a few minutes ago as well. So um, I don't know what to say about all this because it is a problem. And anybody who doesn't think there is a problem with violence in this city just isn't paying enough attention to what's going on. But as always, keep your antenna up, watch what's going on around you, and please, 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 please be careful out there. Uh, Also, uh, some news in the law enforcement arena. Deputy Chief Don Crow with the Memphis Police Department has been named the new assistant chief of police by incoming Chief uh, Davis. Uh, She's going to uh, take the uh, reins, I believe, uh, in another week or so. Uh, He is now the new number two. He's the assistant chief of police for the Memphis Police Department, a 33-year veteran. So congratulations to him. Sister Strut uh, for Cancer Awareness happened over the weekend. Breast Cancer Awareness happened over. uh, This happened over a big event. It was uh, in the cars this weekend. They did the cars again this, uh, this past weekend, but a lot of them had pink balloons on, and there were hundreds and hundreds of people out there. It was another amazing uh, event. And, of course, this all has to do with uh, breast cancer awareness, and uh, we're going to try to find a cure for all of that. So congratulations to all of those who participated and who were involved, and I know that it was an absolutely amazing event. And uh, in the world of sports, uh, you know the Olympics is supposed to happen in another couple of months or so. I say supposed to because Japan is having some serious problems with COVID. And uh, will it happen? Won't it happen? The folks in Japan say it will. Everybody else is like, I'm not too sure about that. But um, folks are starting to get ready for it. And uh, Simone Biles, I'm sure you've heard of Simone Biles, gymnast, you know, that wins everything, that basically just, when she shows up, everybody just says, oh, forget it, put the leotards on. They put everything on and just just go back to the parking lot. Because uh, <laughs> every time she enters one of these competitions, she wins big. So yesterday she won her seventh gymnastics title in this country. Uh, and again, she's getting ready for the Tokyo Olympics. They will actually have the trials for the Olympics in the next few weeks, and of course, it'll be her and whoever else decides that they want to be, you know, get close enough. To, they won't beat her, but whoever in the United States gets close enough to to uh, to uh, to compete and uh, get enough points to be able to send themselves over to Tokyo so they can hang out with her. All right, uh, as uh, we uh, prepare to start launch on this show on this Monday. Uh, Before we go to break, or as we go to break, uh, I'm going to play a little bit of a tribute to the man uh, known as Prince. Prince Rogers Nelson uh, would have been 63 years old today. So we're going to play one of my favorite uh, Prince songs as we go into break. This is Real Talk Memphis. Hit it, Adam. This is Real Talk Memphis. I am your humble host, Chip Washington. When we come back, we are going to kick things off and get it started. Uh, You don't want to miss the show tonight. It's a good show. It was a great open, right? Okay, it'll be a great show. This is Real Talk Memphis. I'm Chip. You know who you are. This is Prince. We'll be right back.
If you like Real Talk, here's a way you can get involved. Do you have a show topic idea or suggestion? Want to be considered a guest or have a guest idea? Then send Chip a message on his Real Talk show page and you can be a part of the Real Talk experience. So as he always says, go out and tell somebody. We'll be right back. This is Bishop Phoebe Rofe of the Episcopal Diocese of West Tennessee. Tune in every Thursday morning at 8 a.m. at WYXR 91.7 FM to hear conversations with community leaders about the role of faith in their lives. That's Faithfully Memphis right here on WYXR FM. Hi there, this is Zach Ives. My show, A Box of Records, plays every Tuesday night, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m., right here on WYXR 91.7 FM, Memphis, Tennessee. Get Real Talk on the TuneIn mobile app under WYXR, and he's now streaming live on Facebook. And you can also catch a rebroadcast on YouTube. Just put WYXR in the search box and hit subscribe. Now back to more Real Talk with Chip Washington. And welcome back to Real Talk Memphis on this Monday, June 7th. Hope everybody's doing okay. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, we don't really discuss a lot um, is our sense of hearing, which, of course, is very, very important, by the way. Um, but, you know, a lot of people have this issue. A lot of people have this problem. A lot of people are always looking for solutions. My first guest tonight uh, is going to talk a little bit uh, with us about uh, hearing Healthcare. Her name is Dr. Janie Johnson. She is the assistant professor in the School of Communication. Rewind. She is Dr. Janie Johnson, assistant professor, School of Communication Services. I'm a communicator. That, that, that's as bad as it got. At the University of Memphis in the hearing healthcare area. Dr. Janie, thank you for being with me tonight. In spite of my uh, English uh, um, issues tonight, I really appreciate you showing up. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. So listen, uh, you know, last month was, I, I guess it was, what, Better Hearing Month? Is Did I get that yes. right? Better Speech and Hearing Month. Better Speech and Hearing Month. And, uh, you know, you and I were talking a bit offline, talking about just really how big a problem this is in terms of, um, you know, the number of people who have hearing issues, um, being able to kind of approach that in in terms of care, um, hearing aids and things like this. Tell me basically uh, in your particular area, uh, what exactly is it that you focus on? Okay, well, um, like you said, uh, I'm I'm in the School of Communication Sciences and Disorders at the University of Memphis, and I'm the director of the Hearing Aid Research Lab there. So overall, my research is designed to help people from a variety of different backgrounds mm -hmm. access high quality, affordable hearing care and to optimize outcomes with hearing treatments like hearing aids. Um, and you're exactly right. It is a huge deal. Hearing loss is one of the top three most prevalent chronic problems that we experience as we age. And it's commonly accepted that hearing aids are the treatment of choice for this type of hearing loss. Mm -hmm. But research also shows that only about one third of adults that could benefit from hearing aids actually use them in their daily lives. And that is actually far less for individuals who identify as belonging to a racial or ethnic minority cultural group. So it, it is a, it's a large um, healthcare disparity in, wow. in terms of hearing healthcare. Absolutely. And because of the disparity that you just mentioned, why is that? What is the primary uh, cause of why there is such a, a growing disparity? Is it, is it strictly cost or are there other associated factors with that? 
Well, one, of course, is a, you, you nailed it, is cost. Mm -hmm. Cost is huge. Um, hearing aids are sold kind of like cars, you know, where there's a general make and model you know, like a Toyota sedan, but also coming in at different levels, depending on the features you want. Mm -hmm. So like I have a Honda van. And when I was looking at them, there was the basic one. It's like an LX and then some mid levels and then the top luxury versions. Right. So hearing aids are like that too. And some of those premium hearing aids are really slick. They've got really good, sophisticated features, uh -huh. but they can come in at super high price points between five and $10,000 for a pair of hearing wait, aids. Wait, 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 what? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And most insurance companies don't pay for those or for those services. Um, oh, but my. Well, that's, I know, yeah, that's... but our research, research that I have done has shown that people can, with typical age-related hearing loss, can really get just as much listening benefit with some of those more basic models okay. if they have professional support. Okay. But like you said, cost is not the only issue because cost is an issue for everyone. Yeah. Um, but there are some other things. Actually, some of my dissertation research was in the Memphis community with uh, adults who were Caucasian, African-American, Hispanic. Uh -huh. And we found, you know, there was really... Um, across the board, everyone's concerned with things like cost mm -hmm. and concerns that maybe hearing aids aren't going to be worth the effort that you have to put into it. Right. Um, and then of course there's the issue that hearing loss and hearing aids are related to age related stereotypes about getting older. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't want to admit that they're having problems that are associated with aging or they don't want to be perceived as getting older. Um, and hearing loss is in, invisible. So it's kind of easy to ignore that or hide it from others for a long time. But in my research, I've seen that African-American and Hispanic adults experience additional cultural and structural barriers to getting uh, hearing aids using traditional methods. Explain that, explain that. Well, things like, so the, the studies that I did, their interview research, so really trying to understand from um, these individuals' perspectives what what was a barrier to them? Mm -hmm. um, and then a lot of times there are things like structural barriers. So, you know, having fewer resources, like not only money, but paid time off or having less access to luxury model insurance plans mm -hmm. that might cover mm -hmm. hearing aids, but also things just like relying less on traditional medicine and, you know, trusting in a, in a doctor recommendation um, and also sort of accepting hearing loss is just like, this is just what you do. And as you get older and you know, you just kind of, we're going to get on with it um, without seeking that help. What is the, if you can, I don't even know if you can pinpoint it or not, but the percentage of individuals that you're aware of that do have hearing loss issues that actually go out and, and do something about it in terms of exploring opportunities to get hearing aids or, or other, you know, methods to be able to help to improve their hearing? Mm -hmm. Well, like I said, the, the general trend for research in, in the United States is about one third of people who have hearing problems and could benefit from hearing aids um, will actually pursue that. Uh -huh. um, but the statistics also show that that happens usually on average uh, somewhere around 10 years after they've realized they've had hearing problems wow. before they actually decide to do something about it. Wow. Talking with Dr. Janie Johnson, she is the assistant professor in the School of Communication Services at the University of Memphis. And we're talking uh, uh, hearing care and uh, hearing aids and, and all things like that. I'm still blown away by the fact that you mentioned a few minutes ago uh, the cost of some of the more higher end hearing aids is anywhere from five to ten thousand dollars. Now, I will tell you that my dearly departed mother um, was losing her her hearing, uh, her hearing, you know, at an advanced age, and went down and you know got got a, a hearing aid fitted and the whole nine yards, and and uh, two weeks after I got it home, she lost it, and that thing cost a thousand dollars. I was just like. No, but yeah. um, but I mean, but I mean, it's 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 amazing the astronomical co now. Are I don't even know if this is even a relevant question, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Are are, are medical professionals and people who deal in uh, the hearing uh, aid sciences cognizant of the fact that 
we do have a problem here with with folks uh, that have hearing issues, and 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 we're talking mostly the elderly folks uh, in terms of cost. Is there any sort of a, I don't know, a formula or some sort of a program or something that they can do to help people who have this problem who actually want to be able to to uh, utilize some sense of hearing? Yeah, I mean, this is a continuing issue with yeah, sure. um, seeking funding, like federal funding yeah. um, or, you know, Medicare providing hearing aids. Um, to older individuals who need them, mm -hmm. but and I've done quite a bit of lobbying in Washington D.C. to to try to support this idea, um, but it's so costly. There are so many people who need hearing aids yeah. that the expense to the government that's a limiting factor. Um, and however, as hearing aids become more and more technologically sophisticated, mm -hmm. those basic models, those really less expensive models, mm -hmm. they are also. This is like you know, I'm whispering, they are also really, really technologically sophisticated as well. Okay. So, you know, if you think about those entry level model cars now sure. compared to 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you can get quite a bit of benefit from those less expensive models of devices. Wow. Okay. Well, you know, this is fascinating to me because as I said, I sort of live this, but, um, you know, I guess before I let you go, uh, what are some of the, the telltale signs? I mean, this is kind of what you do on a daily basis when you study uh, for folks who may be experiencing some type of hearing loss or um, sort of a cautionary point to where maybe somebody needs to say, you know, I may I'm, something might be going on here. I may need to, you know, go in and, and have it looked at and taken care of. Uh, you know, I mean, are there some, you know, I mean, what, what are some of the warning signs, if you will, in reference to this? Yeah. Okay. So for, you know, typical age related hearing loss, it can be hard to identify because it happens over time. So gradually, right. So often you just kind of get used to not being able to hear certain things, uh -huh. but you'll probably start noticing it more when you're in a noisy environment. So you can hear just fine when you're watching television at your house, right. but when you're at a restaurant, it's very difficult. You're having to put a lot of effort in and look at people's faces when they're talking. Uh -huh. That might be a clue that you're starting to have some um, decline in your hearing. Um, of course, just you know, bilateral ringing in your ears that's uh -huh. not terribly bothersome but noticeable. That can be an indicator that hearing might be starting to decline in the early stages. Um, but of course, you know, I, I would highly recommend if, if someone has a sudden hearing loss or anything like that, that's a medical emergency. They would need to go to an ENT yeah. um, or a physician for that. Um, but I think that to, to support, to support people's decision to maybe get treatment for this, yeah. um, it should be noted that if you don't treat hearing loss, this is associated with so many other issues like depression and anxiety. Wow. It's also been um, seen as one of the number one modifiable factors that's related to cognitive decline and dementia. There's increased hospital visits, it's associated with lower incomes, um, and they have advanced quite a bit over the last several decades. Mm -hmm. So I would I would really recommend to people if they if they think they're having some trouble, there are a lot of different options that they can then they can pursue. It doesn't have to just be that traditional model. Right. So reach out to an audiologist, you know, try to get some information about uh, support groups or um, other inexpensive devices that could help them in their daily life. So if you think there is a problem, at least go in and get it checked and explore any options that may come from that. Correct? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Even at, at the university, you know, we are our, our University and clinic, we care a lot about the Memphis community. We have a lot of resources available, including financial assistance for hearing loss. Um, so I would recommend that, you know, if, if people are interested or want to get involved in hearing related research or hearing aid related research, we would love for you to come and um, get some experience with hearing aids and part of our research studies. And it can help you become, you know, more informed about what kind of decisions you might want to make about your hearing. Dr. Jamie Johnson, thank you so much for coming on the show tonight and explaining this to us. And I mean, this is, I mean, eye opening for me, uh, no doubt about it. And hopefully for some of our listeners uh, who may have issues that can take advantage of, of, of going, uh, coming down there to see you at the university of Memphis, uh, in terms of, uh, maybe seeing what maybe the next steps might be. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate you. Yes, thank you. And uh, take care of yourself. We'll talk soon. 
Dr. Janie Johnson, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the assistant professor for the School of Communication Services at the University of Memphis, talking about hearing, talking about hearing loss, talking about hearing uh, prevention, uh, hearing loss prevention and uh, hearing aids and things like that. If you have a problem and you think you might have a problem, get it checked. It won't it won't kill you to get it checked. And, you know, you, you might prevent something worse down the road. All right, uh, interview number one done. We are going to take another break. And when we come back, uh, we are going to talk uh, with Mr. Mike Miller, the president of the Memphis Restaurant Association, on a variety of issues. And I want to also talk about his restaurant, too. I went to go visit it over the weekend. This is Real Talk Memphis. I'm Chip. You know who you are. We'll be right back. You're listening to Real Talk with Chip Washington. If you're celebrating a birthday, anniversary, or special occasion, shoot him a note and he'll read it on the air. Get involved and tell somebody about Real Talk. We'll be right back. This is Bishop Phoebe Rofe of the Episcopal Diocese of West Tennessee. Tune in every Thursday morning at 8 a.m. at WYXR 91.7 FM to hear conversations with community leaders about the role of faith in their lives. That's Faithfully Memphis right here on WYXR FM. Yo, what up, what up, what up? It is the president of Driven Type T. And you're now tuned in to Memphis' own WYXR 91.7 FM. The station with the city soul, man. Come on, you know what it is. <laughs> Remember, never stop. Stay driven. Peace. Get Real Talk on the TuneIn mobile app under WYXR, and he's now streaming live on Facebook. And you can also catch a rebroadcast on YouTube. Just put WYXR in the search box and hit subscribe. Now back to more Real Talk with Chip Washington. And welcome back to Real Talk Memphis. Chip here on this Monday and a, a show plug, if you will. Uh, earlier, we talked about the fact that this would have been uh, the artist known as Prince, his 63rd birthday today. And and there is a show on, I think it's tomorrow night. I want to say tomorrow night, 9 o'clock. Uh, it's called The New Untitled Show with Tim and Steve. And they are going to do a a tribute to Prince as well. So <laughs> that's the name of the show. It's the new untitled show with Tim and Steve. So you guys uh, be on the lookout for that and uh, check them out. Okay, um, as we move along here, you know, uh, one of the biggest issues that the pandemic brought forth was uh, everything being closed. And every uh, way businesses had to do business uh, in what was formerly a, a typical, usual way has changed. And, and we include restaurants among that. And they were probably the hardest hit uh, through this pandemic uh, as well. Uh, so joining me tonight is the current president of the Memphis Restaurant Association and owner of Patrick's uh, Neighborhood Restaurant. And let me tell you something. Uh, uh, we'll talk about it in just a second. But his name is Mike Miller. And, Mike, thanks for coming on the show, man. I really appreciate it. Happy to be here. And, listen, I, I visited your fine establishment uh, over the weekend. My wife and I went and had dinner at Patrick's. That's the first time I've been there. And let me tell you something, son. You guys know what you're doing. <laughs> that food was really good. Thank you very much. I really, I really enjoyed it. We both really enjoyed it. And I guess what? I'll be back. I'll be back. That's great. Uh, so I'm your return customer. So, yeah, if you guys haven't gone check out Patrick's, he told me before we even, when we started talking about this a week or so ago, he said, man, it's the best home cooking in town. And yeah, I don't think he, he may not be too far off the mark with that one. I can tell you that right now. But listen, Mike, uh, again, thanks for coming on the show. And 
You know, we talked about, uh, you know, obviously COVID changed all of our lives forever and the way we do business and none more so than uh, the restaurants uh, who suffered uh, quite a quite a great deal from um, from all of the changes and, and everything that has happened uh, up to this point. Now we see uh, numbers are going down. Um, the restrictions are, are being loosened. People are getting back out in the streets. They're coming back out to restaurants to enjoy some good food and, 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 and kind of getting back to, you know, what we once maybe thought was a normal way of living. I guess I should ask you to start. Um, how affected was Patrick's, uh, your business, uh, by uh, the pandemic? And where are we today in your estimation? Well, as far as Patrick's goes, I mean, you know, we suffered just like everybody else in terms of the shutdown when we were forced to, to go uh, to uh, to go only. Uh, that was, uh, you know, the biggest hit for us. And then obviously the ongoing restrictions reduced our opportunities and reduced business, um, you know, for various and sundry reasons. So, uh, you know, I mean, we actually, I think, weathered the storm as well as anybody out there, as far as that goes, mm-hmm. um, I, I know better than some. Uh, you know, I'm sure there were others that were better than us, but uh, we, I think, our our product, our positioning, and the way we re- we reacted, we made the best of what we uh, were forced to deal with. So you know, and and, and having said that, and and uh, as we said a minute ago, things are starting to loosen up, and the folks are getting back out again and and going. But you were telling me last week we were talking that there is still a myriad of issues that you have to deal with, one of which, of course, is um, hiring folks um, or bringing folks back or having folks come back to these uh, places, these restaurants and some of the hospitality industry uh, as a whole. You talked about the supply chain issue. You know, we had a big uh, cyber attack last week for one of the biggest meat processing plants in this country. Talk a little bit about just the sheer challenges even today uh, for the average restaurant owner. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where it it continues to be very rough waters for us um, as a whole. Just as you mentioned, yes, the restrictions are uh, mostly gone. There are recommendations instead of requirements now. That's all positive movement in terms of getting people back out in the community. Um, And so sales are there. But the operational side of things now is where things continue to be a challenge because, you know, obviously when you're down in sales, it's, uh, you know, it's hard to run your business. But when you're when you're generating sales, when the public's coming back out and you can't hire staff to take care of that business, uh, you know, that's a challenge. And yes, the, the supply chain price of commodities, uh, you know, I mean, if you, I, I can't think of anywhere I've been where I haven't seen uh, some measure of price increases. Um, it's just one of those things where we've just got a myriad of, of continued problems. Um, you know, the restaurant business has always been a tough business and, and, uh, you know, we're a resilient group and we'll get through it. But, um, you know, it's one of those things that, that I hope the public recognizes, um, that this isn't just about, well, we were shut down and now things are back to normal. Well, there's so many ripple effects of what's going on worldwide and and here in our country and locally in Memphis. We are speaking with Mike Miller. He is the president of the Memphis Restaurants Association, and he is also the owner of Patrick's um, Restaurant. Now, you know, in in talking about that, I I, I had a conversation. I went to a place uh, not too long ago, a barbecue restaurant, as a matter of fact, and and I was talking to the owner, and I I said, what's wrong, man? You you, you look like you're kind of down. He said, man, he said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I said, well, what do you mean by that? He said, well, he said, I can't hire anybody. I can't even hire high school kids. I can't get anybody to come work for me. He talked about what you mentioned a minute ago about the prices. He said the prices have gone up so dramatically in terms of us being able to buy uh, food like like chicken wings and, 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 and other things like that as well. I mean, he really talked about it in terms of, it just almost really couldn't couldn't be any worse. But he said his sales were doing okay, but there were other elements of what it takes to run a successful business that were really causing him the blues. Are you finding that um, with a lot of the restaurant owners that you, that you speak with on a regular basis? Absolutely. Uh, you know, the staffing issue is is 
one of the things that's at the forefront right now. Uh, the commodities issue, the pricing issues, those are things that you can adjust for if you're on top of things and you're paying attention. But when you can't hire people to come in and do the job, uh, you know, I mean, and we're paying competitive wages. I saw something uh, this morning, as a matter of fact, the restaurant industry, the hospitality industry, its average wage based on this most recent job jobs report is the highest in history, the highest in history. And we are still struggling to get people to come to work. Does that have a lot to do with the fact that when folks were unemployed, they increased the unemployment benefits in states around the country? Now they are starting to lift those because businesses are coming back into 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 the fold. And a lot of these workers are saying, well, you know, I'm not going to go back to work for, you know, eight, nine dollars, ten dollars an hour. You know, when I was making four or five, six hundred dollars a week sitting home, uh, you know, getting additional unemployment. That has got to be a serious, serious challenge to your business. Well, I think that, you know that's certainly part of the problem, and there's no doubt about it that there that there are people that that are disincentivized to go to work when you can earn the same amount of money or not earn it, but have the same amount of income, uh, you know, without having to go to work for whatever reason because you just don't want to work because you're afraid of the virus because of what well, any number of things. But that's not the only factor. Again. One of the things you and I talked about the other day is that, that I was on a call with the commissioner of labor with the state of Tennessee, and there are 160,000 people that are on unemployment in the state of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. About 100,000 of those are getting the federal bump currently. Mm -hmm. That goes, goes away July the 3rd, and I, we'll see what that really affects. But 100,000 people, if we put them all back in the job market, doesn't really solve the problem of jobs in the state of Tennessee, because it's not just the hospitality industry. This is something that's pervasive. We see, we saw so many people that because we were shut down, that they had to find ways to pay their bills, what, whether it is going on unemployment or going to another industry. We've sure. heard stories about people moving to other states that weren't shut down, sure. uh, you know, to take care of their families. So there's a whole myriad of reasons of why we're in the situation we are in and, and eliminating the extra money and, and, and taking away that incentive to not work. Yes, that's a step in the right direction, but it's just going to, it's going to take time to work things out and get people back to work and, you know, figure out where, where things settle, whether it's hospitality industry or the distribution industry, everybody. I mean, I read an article yesterday about FedEx trying to staff yet another uh, yeah. distribution center. Yeah. So, I mean, it's out there everywhere. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, Mike Miller, thank you for taking some time. And I, and if you're okay with it, I want to check with you in, I don't know, maybe three, four months or so down the road a little bit to see, you know, once we get past this unemployment situation and see where the actual job market is and, and how much, if uh, any, it rebounds down the road. I'd be really curious to find out uh, what your perspective is a few months down the road, if you wouldn't mind coming back on the show. Not at all. I'd be happy to. Mike Miller, thank you so much for taking some time, man. I really appreciate you, and uh, I look to talk to you down the road. Sounds good. Have all a good evening. Right. You too. Thank you. Well, that was an interesting conversation. Uh, Mike Miller, president of the Mes Memphis Restaurants Association, giving us his take, a very honest take on exactly where things are in the hospitality industry. We will see how things progress as time moves forward. All right, time for our last break. When we come back, we are going to talk to a man that uh, many of us know. Uh, and, uh, of course, from his days at the Orpheum Theater, his name is Pat Halloran. And he is involved in another project. And it's all about giving back to Memphis. This is Real Talk Memphis. I'm Chip, and we will be, and we will be right back. If you like Real Talk, here's a way you can get involved. Do you have a show topic idea or suggestion? Want to be considered a guest or have a guest idea? Then send Chip a message on his Real Talk show page and you can be a part of the Real Talk experience. So as he always says, go out and tell somebody. We'll be right back.
Hey Memphis, my name is Ron Buck. I am looking forward to bringing you my show, Riverside, every Friday from 1 to 2 p.m. I will be playing rock and blues, old and new, and featuring Memphis music and events. I hope you'll tune in to Riverside every Friday at 1 p.m. on WYXR 91.7 FM, Raised by Sound. everyone, this is Janet, host of Jaunt with Janet, Wednesdays from 4 to 6 p.m., bringing you new releases in the rock, pop, and electronic genres with a little bit of the old fused in, all here on WYXR Memphis, 91.7 FM. You're listening to WYXR 91.7 FM Memphis. This is Nancy, and I hope you'll join me on a musical journey from 2 to 4 p.m. Mondays with Memphis Undercover. Get Real Talk on the TuneIn mobile app under WYXR, and he's now streaming live on Facebook. And you can also catch a rebroadcast on YouTube. Just put WYXR in the search box and hit subscribe. Now back to more Real Talk with Chip Washington. All right, well, <laughs> welcome back to Real Talk Memphis. We had Pat Hallerman on the line. Hey, Pat, if you can hear me or you, uh, you know, you try again. And uh, if you get back on the air, uh, take yourself off mute so you can actually hear me talking. Yeah, well, I don't have his number. He, he can call me if, if uh, Pat, you can call me 205-4790 if you, if you if you can hear me uh, speaking to you wherever it is you are, we did see you. We know that you were on a second ago, and uh, we lost you some kind of way. Uh, so hopefully, uh, if somebody's listening out there, uh, can get a hold of Pat and tell him uh, to uh, hit the Zoom thing again 
or he can uh, give me a call. Uh, we can uh, try to try, try the effort to get him on the air. I don't want to miss him twice now. This will be the second time that we miss it. But he does have a uh, a great uh, nonprofit organization. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, Pat uh, was the uh, president and CEO of the Orpheum Theater Group for 35 years, bringing us some of the best theater uh, that uh, any of us have ever seen. And uh, he retired a few years ago uh, from that end of things, but he also got into uh, his real, I think, um, what, what drives him the most, which is giving back to the community. So he formed a nonprofit organization called Positively Memphis, and uh, it is uh, his nonprofit group, of course, uh, that has given thousands and thousands of dollars back to the Memphis and the Shelby County community. Uh, he sent me a press release uh, to uh, today, as a matter of fact. He's working with Monogram Foods. Monogram Foods, a longtime food distributor, uh, and, of course, uh, the owner of that uh, company, the founder of that company, and Pat have been friends for a very long time. And uh, Pat has a goal now of helping the hunger issue that we are dealing with uh, in our communities. Of course, we know that there is a very high poverty rate in the uh, city of Memphis. And, uh, of course, that is something that he has uh, really uh, been uh, working to try to help in terms of, uh, obviously, finances. And uh, basically that one in four of our children in this community go to bed hungry every single night. This is not the first time we've heard about this. Uh, This has been going on for quite some time. Well, actually, he has uh, gotten a pledge from the uh, Monogram Foods Corporation uh, for $50,000 as a matching grant. And uh, basically, if... uh, if uh, Positively Memphis was able to raise $50,000, Monogram Foods would match that amount, and $100,000 will be available to lessen the present hunger issue in our community's children. So, um, you know, Pat is working real hard to try to make things better for all of us in this community. And uh, I really, man, I hate that that uh, we had him on. We had him on a second ago. He was there. And I kept trying to, you know, uh, you know, get his attention and say, you know, to take us, take him off mute and uh, to try to see if we can get him on the air. I uh, still have a few minutes uh, to go here. Uh, we're going to take uh, one more quick break and uh, see if we can't maybe effort him for a couple of minutes. Uh, anyway, this is Real Talk Memphis. I'm Chip. Uh, stay with us. We'll be right back. If you like Real Talk, here's a way you can get involved. Do you have a show topic idea or suggestion? Want to be considered a guest or have a guest idea? Then send Chip a message on his Real Talk show page and you can be a part of the Real Talk experience. So as he always says, go out and tell somebody. We'll be right back. There's really nothing better than a box of records. Hi there, this is Zach Ives. My show, A Box of Records, plays every Tuesday night, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m., right here on WYXR 91.7 FM, Memphis, Tennessee. Yo, what up, what up, what up? It is the president of Driven Type T, and you're now tuned in to Memphis's own WYXR 91.7 FM. The station with the city soul, man. Come on, you know what it is. <laughs> Remember, never stop. Stay driven. Peace. You're listening to WYXR 91.7 FM Memphis. This is Nancy, and I hope you'll join me on a musical journey from 2 to 4 p.m. Mondays with Memphis Undercover. Mm-hmm. 
Hey Memphis, my name is Ron Buck. I am looking forward to bringing you my show, Riverside, every Friday from 1 to 2 p.m. I will be playing rock and blues, old and new, and featuring Memphis music and events. I hope you'll tune in to Riverside every Friday at 1 p.m. on WYXR 91.7 FM, Raised by Sound. everyone, this is Janet, host of Jaunt with Janet, Wednesdays from 4 to 6 p.m., bringing you new releases in the rock, pop, and electronic genres with a little bit of the old fused in, all here on WYXR Memphis, 91.7 FM. Real Talk on the TuneIn mobile app under WYXR, and he's now streaming live on Facebook. And you can also catch a rebroadcast on YouTube. Just put WYXR in the search box and hit subscribe. Now back to more Real Talk with Chip Washington. All right, we're back to Real Talk Memphis. Pat, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, very good. So listen, Pat, uh, real quickly, and I'm sorry we're having some technical issues with you here. I want to talk a little bit about Positively Memphis. I don't have a lot of time, but I want you to talk about your nonprofit organization and how you're trying to improve the lives of, of Memphians here. All right, I'll do that. You want me to just start now? Go ahead, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Well, this is Pat Halloran, and uh, I started Positively Memphis uh, in mid-2019 after I retired from the Orpheum. And what we decided to do initially... Go ahead, Pat. What we, de- what we decided to do initially was to have luncheons where we'd bring speakers in talking about the most positive things happening in the city. Yes, sir. Whether it was construction of an area or a new program in education or society changes. Anyway, that's what our luncheons were all about. Then the pandemic closed us down. And we took that year to sit back and think about really what do we need to do. And then we came up to the conclusion we needed to be a little bit more serious and we needed to take on a bigger project. And we kept seeing billboards around town where one out of four or one out of five kids in the city goes to bed hungry every night. And that's a fact. Yes, sir. And so we decided to tackle that. And so that's what we're doing. We're raising money to give to organizations that are already set up but that are dealing with the kids that are living in homes that don't have enough to eat. And that's all we're, that's what we're doing. And we've got a challenge grant, $50,000. If we raise 50, give us a hundred thousand and then we'll keep going from there. But we're working it and uh, we're already at 15,000 to get our 50. And then uh, we'll just keep going from there. Hey, Pat, before you go, and I'm sorry, like I said, we, we, we're really out of time here, but I want people to know how they can get in touch with your organization if they want to give and they want to contribute. What do they need to do? They need to contact me directly, pathalloran37 at gmail.com. Small letters, no space. pathalloran37 at gmail.com. And we're looking for volunteers as well as money to help us uh, get this up and running. Well, man, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to have you back. I promise you that. But we're, we're, we'll figure out all this technical stuff here. <laughs> all I mean, right. It happens all the time. But listen, thank you for coming on the show. And I'm going to have you back because I want to talk more about what you're doing. I want to talk about uh, your career at the Orpheum and, and, and how you're shifting positions, but you're still helping to benefit the city of Memphis. And, and you're a treasure. We appreciate you. Well, I'd love to do it. Let me know. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you. All right. Okay. Yeah, okay. Take it bye. All right, thanks, guys, for uh, for bearing with us tonight. That was Pat Halloran. Uh, we got to get out of here now. Uh, but uh, I think it was a pretty good show. I hope you did, too, as well. Thank you for being with us. Uh, for Adam, for Marquette, for Jack, I'm Chip. This is Real Talk Memphis, and we are out.
with your main chip Washington. When it comes to information, the main got an arsenal. Bring you up to speed with what you need. He's the local and nationwide news feed. Let's talk about it. Dialect to do something about it. Chip got the pro wide open. 